All right. So is my screen being shared at this point? Uh, yes, indeed. Okay. All right. So I want to welcome everyone to um, our virtual event. Um, this virtual event is Project Management Iron Triangle versus Agile. Uh, my name is Greg Greenlee. I am the founder of the Blacks of Technology Organization. Um, and we have Alex Bernadin. Uh, he's going to be our guest speaker um, this evening. Uh, we also have Dennis Schultz, who is the executive director of the Blacks and Technology Foundation, which is our uh, 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, this is your first time uh, participating in anything related to Blacks and Technology. Uh, we've been around since around 2008. Um, we currently have uh, 30 chapters spread around five countries. Uh, we are one of the largest community of black technologists uh, in the world. Uh, we have a database, as you see, of 11,000 plus. Uh, we do have a membership program. Uh, if you go to foundation.blacksandtechnology.net, uh, you can join Box of Technology for free, uh, and there are uh, there we have quite a few resources and benefits for for members, such as certifications and training. So, we've partnered with a number of different organizations, such as uh, like the Linux Foundation, Amazon, uh, so on and so forth, to provide certifications, training. Um, there's opportunities for speaking engagement, opportunities to be published. Uh, we have career coaching and mentorship. And on blacksandtechnology.net, on our jobs board, there is uh, opportunities to employment opportunities. So uh, you can upload your resume uh, to our database uh, so that uh, you know people or organizations and companies that are looking for very talented and diverse uh, individuals can 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 find you in there. And then we also have a number of companies that are constantly posting to our jobs board. So check that out, uh, utilize that. These companies reach out to us in order, uh, again, to source uh, or to get applicants uh, who are talented, who are diverse. Uh, so they definitely are reaching out to our network in order to, to source uh, talent. Uh, so with that, I want to, I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, and I want to introduce um, Alex Bernadin. So Alex Bernadin is an agilist, a project manager. He's also a photographer, a baker. I didn't know that. That's dope. Uh, and former developer. Uh, he's been contributing to building websites, web applications since 96. That's 1996. Uh, Alex is currently head of project management at Script D. Uh, so Alex, I want uh, to say thank you and uh, for joining us and, and being our speaker this, this week. And I'll hand it over to you. Oh, real quick, let me let me do some quick. Um, so for those who, who recently just joined um, uh, the Zoom call. Uh, if you have questions uh, and you want to express those questions verbally, just use the raise hand function uh, and we'll unmute your mic. Uh, otherwise, you can post in either QA or chat uh, at your questions there and we'll we'll get to them. And then Alex will go through uh, once again what what the, you know, his background is about uh, as far as the polling and things like that. So I'll hand it over to uh, to Alex. Cool. Thank you, Greg. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a little bit surreal not to see faces except for Greg's, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna try to work through that. Uh, my my, face, uses... my face is enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you spent more time in the foodie channel on the BIT Slack, you'd know I bake a lot, but <laughs> it's okay. You have other things to do, it's fine. Um, so, <clears throat> My company tends to use Meet a lot, and so I'm used to seeing the little grid view with all the all the folks. But it's cool. I'm just gonna I'm gonna channel it. So what you've got up on my screen right now is um, something I like to do sometimes, just to get a sense of who's in the room. And um, what we see here is first responses to this poll. You can chime in on the poll if you want. If you've just arrived, going to menti.com and using the number code that's at the top of that screen. Uh, and really, we're just saying like, who are we? Who's here? People have all different kinds of identities. There's a lot of intersectionality in our communities. And I really love to see uh, those identities recognized and, and shared. So thank you for being here. We're going to cover some uh, a cool topic, what I think is a cool topic. Caveat on this, I am a massive process nerd. I could talk for hours about how any team of people ever gets anything done. I think it's fascinating. Um, I initially, I spent the first 
many years of my career as a developer, um, but I'm really glad that a friend pushed me into doing project management because it's a space that I really enjoy. I genuinely enjoy figuring out how to make the process of making software smooth and enjoyable and sustainable and all of those good things. So let me shift gears just a bit. And I'm going to skip the geography question. I'm going to slide right into my slide deck. Our topic for today. Do I want to skip the geography question? No, I actually want to switch to a different question. So our topic for today is talking about two things. It is something called the Iron Triangle and Agile. And kind of does the key question of do Agile methodologies make the Iron, tri iron Triangle irrelevant? So to help me, I want to know what y'all's familiarity is with these two concepts. So I'm going to try another mentee poll. Um, it's going to hey, Alex, they're, 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 real yeah. quick, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, uh, but they're asking you to share your, are you sharing your screen? I am not or, doing it as a screen share. Does it not, uh, does it not take up enough of the space if you pin my, you pin me? Uh, you are indeed pinned. It should, okay, be, um, cool. it should be maximized now. Excellent. Yeah, Great. they're they're saying they can see your screen. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And please feel free to interrupt me again. I have multiple screens here, so I'll try to shift my attention periodically, but it might be tough. Um, so while folks are filling in this poll, I will say, give you a little bit more information about me. I work at a company called Scribd. Scribd is a reading subscription service. Nine bucks a month gets you ebooks, audiobooks, sheet music, article content, podcasts, all sorts of stuff like that. I think it's a really good company. I've been here for, I've been at Scribd for six plus years at this point. We are hiring. Uh, we have a very large engineering staff um, since our primary product is, you know, a, an application on iOS, Android, and web. So please do check it out, scribd.com. Uh, and you can take a look and see if there's any positions that look cool, uh, or if you want to sign up for a subscription, that's cool too. So as the responses are popping in, it does look like a lot of folks are not familiar with the Iron Triangle, which is completely fine. I am going to talk about what it is and give you some of the background and some of the um, context for it. I've got a couple of people who are feeling confident, which is great. Um, you can chime in in chat if you want to uh, critique my interpretation. Um, I do not have a problem with that. And I do have several breaks uh, for questions and answers at different points in the Prezi. So you'll have a moment for us to have a little bit more of a discussion if you like. So cool. The second big concept that we're gonna tackle is agile methodologies. And so that, is my next question. How familiar, how familiar are you with Agile methodologies? Um, it's actually the same Menti code. It's just the next one in the pile. Um, and I'm hoping that folks are familiar, but if you're not, it's totally fine. You can be honest. Uh, you don't have to be an expert in order to in, engage in this presentation. Cool, lots of responses popping in, terrific. Some people feeling very confident about their Agile methodology knowledge, that's awesome, love that. Okay, cool, I don't want to spend too much time on this piece. It feels like we got a solid chunk of our members responding and these are pretty much the numbers I was hoping for. So yay, thank you. Thanks for chiming in. Uh, now I will dive in. I won't share with you my speaker notes. That would be tedious. I'll slide those over here for me. And I'll make this big. So hopefully it's legible. If it feels illegible, please do chime in and Greg will interrupt me and we can address it. <clears throat> so this is what we're here for, Iron Triangle versus Agile. Where are we gonna go? We're gonna talk about what the Iron Triangle is um, as a concept. It's been around for quite a long time. Um, we're gonna talk about where it's useful and what it's useful for. 
Then we're going to shift gears and talk about agile methods uh, very broadly, very high level, what I mean when I say agile methodologies to contextualize the discussion. Then we're going to dive into this question of does agile beat the, the iron triangle? Does it make the iron triangle irrelevant? Uh, I think uh, Greg phrased it in the, the header card of the meetup as like a, a I forgot the term you use, like a head to head or something like that. So we'll discuss whether or not that's a reasonable way of looking at this. Is that a good framing for this conversation? And in between the triangle usefulness and the agile methods, and then in between that and does it be the triangle, we'll have moments for Q&A. All righty, so first up, the concept of the iron triangle. It's not a complicated concept. Variations on this have existed since at least the 1950s and probably before that, honestly. Fundamentally, the triangle shape reinforces the concept that if you change one of these elements, the others will have will feel pressure to change as well. There's hundreds of versions of this triangle diagram out there in the world, probably thousands, probably more. Some of them uh, have variations where quality is in the center. Some of them call the center area the scope. Um, and then they call one of the edges quality. Uh, there's a four-sided version that tries to split out scope and quality and make each of those a side. But fundamentally, I think trinities resonate for people, uh, and the triangle get, gets referenced quite a bit in software development. Very often, it's by project managers when they're talking to the people who do, are doing the building work or when they're talking to their project stakeholders. And oftentimes, it's summed up as good, fast, cheap. Choose two can't have all three. Um, if you're going to have it good and fast, it's going to be expensive. If you're going to have it fast and cheap, it's not going to be very good. Uh, if you're going to have it good and cheap, it's going to take a long time. So this is essentially what the Iron Triangle refers to. Uh, there's a white paper that I read, someone who did like a literature analysis, including using some machine learning techniques to analyze all of the writing that has been done over decades about the Iron Triangle. And this person was specifically questioning, uh, has there been a shift in that third piece, the scope or quality piece? Has there been a shift of if one or the other is the correct one? So there's been an absurd amount of effort put into thinking about this triangle. And that's one of the reasons why you'll hear it referenced a lot. And it's one of the reasons why it felt like a relevant topic to share and to talk through, because I think that when some of us enter the workplace and it's a new workplace for us. It's a new industry that we're working in. When these term, terms are thrown around and we don't know what it is, it's kind of intimidating. And it feels like this big deal thing that has all this weight. And so I like to explain some of these concepts sometimes to demystify them and to kind of take the teeth out of it and say, look, this isn't a complicated, deep thing. It's just a term that we've gotten used to throwing around and using for specific purposes. So let's unpack it a little bit. Let's talk about um, why we have it as a triangle. It has a certain intuitive nature. It makes you want to think about a physical thing, right? It makes you want to think about a piece of metal in the shape of a triangle or a string maybe of a fixed length that's put into a triangle shape. Or maybe it triggers vague memories of like geometry class and some formula about calculating the sum of the angles. Like if you know two of the angles and you can figure out the third one, or if you know the length of one side, blah, 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 blah. Um, calling it this iron triangle reinforces the notion that it has some kind of immutability, that it's fixed somehow, that it has no flexibility. And that's inherently at odds with the concept of changing one parameter requiring changing the other parameters. But don't think about that. It's, it's, that's overthinking it. This is really meant as, or it's used as, uh, as kind of a, a tool for conceptualizing trade-offs. We'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about what these vertices are. First one, what's scope? What's the project? What's being built? What are the features, the functionality, the requirements, uh, the statement of work, if you will? If you're working on a project that, that's being run using a waterfall style of project management, where you go distinctly from a requirements gathering phase to a design phase, to a build phase, to a testing phase, then the scope of the project is expected to be really well defined right up front at the beginning. And that sets the tone, it determines the cost 
and the timeline for the project. Um, so sometimes the middle of this triangle is considered the project scope and the changeable side is considered quality. Most of the places where I've worked, it feels really strange to think about quality as being a negotiable. So I tend to think that scope makes a lot more sense in terms of um, features and functionality. I wouldn't say that you would compromise quality. Um, if, you're, if you're making good decisions, you're not choosing to compromise quality. You would choose to reduce the scope. Now, reality is often we do compromise on quality, but that's one of the kind of pitfalls of this approach, in my opinion, as opposed to being part of the intention. So second, uh, second side, time. Hopefully this one's fairly intuitive. How much time will it take to deliver or to complete the project? Uh, and generally this is how many days, weeks, months, also known as when are you gonna be done? When will this be done? It does not refer to ideal days or person days. It really is thinking about the calendar. And like, is this thing launching before December 1st? And that's because the, the usual audience for the triangle or the, the folks who are who we're talking to when you're using the triangle as a tool are folks who need to make those kinds of choices. These are folks who are responsible at the business level for saying, should we do this project? Should we continue this project? Will we get this out in front of our customers before XYZ holiday? Um, that's why time is not about the more granular you know, how many hours do you need to do your piece? It really is about at the project level, when will this thing be done? And I see we have a question, can this method apply for projects within an organization when all the players involved are paid a salary? Yes, absolutely. And that's because the third side of the triangle is about cost. Ostensibly, this refers to, this could refer to how much a client is paying a vendor. In reality, it almost always translates to people's time and energy. Because for the most part, if you're doing a project within an organization, if you're not actually a vendor delivering something to a client, then the cost to the company is the people's time. Um, even when we have people on a salary, if I dedicate Team X or people one, two, and three, Jim, Jane, and John, if I allocate the three of them to a project, that's costing the company money. Every day that they're on that project costs the company money that could be going to another project. So cost in this case definitely refers to the amount of effort, the amount of energy, the amount of resources. It could also refer to other tools and resources that people need, hardware, devices, software licenses. Those things could also be part of the cost. But by and large, in, uh, at a business level, the highest cost is your people's time. That is the one which is almost always the one that we're worried about. So as an example, when your project manager comes to you and says, would it help if we hired a contractor? Or could we bring the data in if we add people to the team? They're talking about increasing the cost of the project. That's what that math is for them. And that's the discussion that they that, that project manager would then be having with their their business stakeholder, whoever the and I'm using a lot of like corporate speak. I apologize. Like in my company, we're relatively small. We don't use a lot of corporate speak. But when we're when I'm trying to talk about patterns across the entirety of our industry, it's hard to avoid um, because otherwise I'll be pigeonholing it into um, uh, patterns that are more common to smaller companies, larger companies, et cetera, et cetera. So I apologize if there's any terminology that I'm using that you're not familiar with, you can ask and I'll try to clarify. Um, but when you're discussing with stakeholders, when you're discussing with project sponsors, um, what are the implications of this choice? And you're saying, well, we can add that feature, but it's going to increase the cost of the project. You're talking about what's going to, it's going to mean that we have to add three people to the team or we have to include another team to take on some of the responsibility for the work. That's what we mean by cost. So that was relatively quick. Uh, I wanna pause for a second and give folks a chance to ask questions. I know I saw one. Um, are there other questions? This is, this is the basic concept of the Iron Triangle. Up next, we're gonna talk about kind of what it's useful for, which I've started alluding to already, but I did wanna give a moment to see if 
any of that, if any folks want clarification on any of that, or um, if there's questions about how this applies in your space. And again, I just want to remind people if you want to ask a question verbally, just click on the uh, raise hand um, function and we'll unmute you. Cool. Everyone knows everything. I love it. Love it when that happens. Um, I'll give you a few more seconds of awkward silence. Uh, looks like we've we've got some. You guys, uh, is my mic functioning? Yes, we can yes. hear you. All right. Um, my quick question. I'm not sure if it's a question or if it's a a, a practice. I um, I've used both methodology. The uh, iron triangle at the program management level. It's applied, and agile methodology. It's at the core of uh, dev project management. Is that practice, does that practice make sense? I've used it with a larger team. Now that I have a much smaller team, it's hard for me to use <laughs> because I no longer have hard to use? program and project management, those two blend. So I don't have at the program management level, it disappear. So now program and project management become one and it, the juggling in between the two methodology is extremely hard. Do you have any uh, uh, input on that? Um, what you're saying makes sense to me. It, it matches my experience as well. There are, there is a, a scale of organization where the tools that makes sense for like a very large set of, of issues or set of projects don't make as much sense, but the team is too big to just use the small sized ones. There's, there's an awkward teenage size in the middle where that is a challenge for sure. I, I agree with that or that matches my experience. I don't have a magic wand solution, but I, I fully acknowledge like, yeah, mm -hmm. there's, some, there's some friction there. So uh, Xing Jiang wants to know how do we how to make sure we deliver the project on time? Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah, that is that is project management. That is what that is. Um, there is no one answer to that question. There is uh, there is an entire industry of probably millions of people who get paid to try to make that happen every day. So I'll certainly talk about things that I like or approaches that I think are effective. Um, and you'll see that reflected in some of the rest of the talk. So we can, we can talk more at the end about if you think I'm <coughs> um, offering useful in insights or if you think I'm way off base. All righty, I'm gonna bounce into the next topic. Okay, so what is this useful for? What is this good for? Um, Fundamentally, this triangle is about trade-offs. I alluded to that a little bit earlier. The premise is pretty simple. Sometimes you're in a rush. You, let's say you need a suit for your cousin's wedding. The suit does not have to be amazing and you don't want to spend a fortune on it, but you definitely need it like by this weekend. You kind of need it now. So you go to Nordstrom Rack, you find something budget, fits reasonably well. You kept your time and your cost fixed. And so you compromised on your scope or your quality. Another time, you might need a suit for your own wedding. So it definitely needs to be right. It has to fit well, it has to be the right color, right style, et cetera. If you have enough money, then you say, okay, cool. I can cover the cost of a custom tailored suit. If you don't have that much money, you have to keep your cost fixed, but you have more time, then maybe you can buy something off the rack, take it to a tailor, have it adjusted. So these examples show kind of how the triangle applies when you're thinking about a project or something that you're trying to achieve. There's this trade-off that happens all the time, it happens in all different parts of life. It happens anytime a set of people is trying to accomplish some work. 
the trade-offs that are dictated by the triangle come up much more in my experience when a project's already underway and something changes. So you had uh, a scope that you agreed on. You said, okay, this is the project. We're going to build a thing. It's going to look like, you know, we want it to look like this. Can you do that? Yes, you can do that. How much time will it take you? This much time. How much will that cost me? This much. Okay, cool. We get into it. Hey, wait, we have some technical problems. Or, hey, wait, I really want this additional feature. Can you do that? Well, I could do that, but it's going to take me more time. Or it's gonna, you're going to have to pay more because I'm going to have to bring in a contractor. I'm going to have to bring in more help. I'm going to have to pay more. That's where I see the triangle come up a lot. Um, and it's totally reasonable. It's useful for that. It's, it's helping the person who is trying to decide whether or not to move forward. It's helping them to recognize that there's a trade-off choice to make. You can do X, but it will take Y. And the reason that these three are often the, the ones that are, that, that are called out is because after hundreds of thousands of millions of projects, the conventional understanding is it really does come down to these three. You're making a choice between these three things. It's not just two things, it's these three things that you're, you're debating between. Sometimes you'll say you wanna prioritize one over the other. Sometimes you'll say, you know, I want to achieve all these three things. And someone will say, well, <laughs> good luck. You can really only have two of those. So let's look at another example that many of you might recognize. In this example, we're going to see uh, an earnest project manager's attempt to assert the trade-offs dictated by the, triangle, by the iron triangle. And you're going to have to tell me if the audio works on this. Oops, why did you stop? Don't stop. There we go. Yeah, I don't hear any audio. Uh, so frustrating. Don't know if you all recognize this scene or not. No audio here. Uh-oh. That's a bummer. So I will talk through it. This is, this is a scene from uh, one of the Star Wars movies where Darth Vader shows up at the building of the new Death Star, Death Star number two. And uh, the dude he's walking with, you know, says, hey, you're here, um, cool. And Vader's like, hey, buddy, I'm here to get you back on schedule. He's like, what do you mean? I couldn't possibly, we're working so hard. And he says, well, guess what? My boss is coming, the emperor is coming, so brace yourself. And the guy's like, oh, uh, we'll figure it out. So this is the triangle, right? The dude's like, but you asked the impossible. I need more men. What's he saying? He's saying, look, I can't do it. Uh, you can't, you know, we've run into problems. The scope has changed. And so the cost is gonna go up or I need more time. I can't do it on this time with this many people with this more scope. I can't do it. That's what he's calling out. And what we also see in that example is how did he deal with it? Uh, come on, next, there we go. Uh, let's not talk about that one quite yet. I don't wanna distract you, but so the other interesting thing about this example is that it highlights one of the one of the tricky things about the iron triangle because the reality is these scenarios happen every day every day these discussions happen where a project manager or a dev says look is not going to happen and stakeholder says but it has to happen we promised we said this we said that it has to happen and so do what you gotta do. And in the ideal world, this is where project managers try to say, well, you see, there's this trade-off. And so if we change this and we have to change that, da, 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 so we'll have to bring someone in. Reality is bringing more people in doesn't always work. Um, paying more doesn't always work. What often will happen is the people who are already on the project will put in more effort, they will, increase the cost of delivering, but the cost will be invisible. It won't actually be translated to the stakeholders. The stakeholders won't end up paying more. The company won't, up, won't end up investing more in that result. They're simply relying on the goodwill of the people who are on the team through peer pressure, through whatever other uh, mechanisms they can do, which in my opinion is a real shame. It's, it's definitely one of the 
problems or, or bad uh, patterns that we fall into in our industry. Um, and I think that the, the reliance on the iron triangle is part of that problem. Because we have this thing that we use to talk about, we say, well, we made a trade off. You know, we said if we, if we change the scope, then we have to change the cost. We said that, but we didn't actually hold to it because ultimately we don't, we can't always, we don't always have that power in the room. And so it's, it's tricky. Let's talk about another kind of real world ish feeling example. Um, my company, as I said, uses Google Meet a lot instead of Zoom. Um, one of the things that we noticed was, hey, Zoom has background images and they look really cool. It has background like videos and all that. It's really awesome. Um, and so imagining that you were at Google or another company who made a video conferencing software. And so a product owner says, oh my God, Zoom has background images. We have to compete with them. What do we do? If you apply to a traditional project management approach, the team says, okay, tell us exactly what you want to build and we'll figure out how to build it. We'll figure out how much time it'll take. Do a bunch of requirements, do the work breakdown, create time estimates. Product owner says, my God, like six months, you know, we're going to be dead by then. Zoom will have eaten our lunch. They're, they're already IPOing. It's going to be out of control. So, okay, we need it sooner. Um, all right, well, Iron Triangle says we can add more people. Well, can we afford that many people? And if we did add more people, like how tight can we make it? I don't know. We got to go back and reestimate, refigure it out. Uh, we still can't bring it in soon enough. Okay, we have to cut features. So, or you get into building it and you say, hey, we ran into some really hard problems. And the, the product owners say, but we said it was going to be done. We really have to have it. Um, otherwise, we're not going to be able to compete. This sucks. We talked about this four months ago. You told me it was going to be doable. And now, like you're saying, it can't be done. Oh my God, that's so frustrating. Where do we end up with? We end up everyone frustrated, the business not getting what it needs, the product not getting out, and ultimately, uh, everyone kind of mutually dissatisfied. So why would you use the triangle? The triangle is good to make good bets. The triangle helps you when you're doing, as, uh, as Sorrel alluded to, when you're doing this high level planning, program level planning, organization level planning, and you wanna choose what things are worth investing in using the triangle to be aware of the balance between cost and time and effort can help you make good choices and say, well, we should invest in this one because it has a good ratio of these things. It can also help you to avoid what are called sunk cost traps. You get partway through a project, you really wanna see it through to the end. But if you realize that the cost has gone up significantly, and that in order to balance that, you would have to cut features dramatically. Or if you're running out of time because the, the scope has increased, and you say, well, if we don't get this out by X, it's not gonna be in place for Christmas and we're not gonna see the return that we really expected, we should stop this project. The triangle can help bring awareness to those kinds of situations to help you make good business decisions to avoid uh, continuing to throw, as they say, good money after bad. The third thing that it can be really helpful for is to avoid or to minimize feature creep. And somebody called out feature creep in the, in the chat as well. It's a very common phenomena. You get going on something and somebody's like, oh, I had this great idea. We should add XYZ into the, into the feature because it's going to be awesome. Or because our competitors added this recently, we should add it to that thing we're releasing too. So just make it part of the same project. It's cool, just add it in. The Iron Triangle gives you a framework to discuss the fact that, well, if we add more work to what we already had planned, then the time's going to increase. Or maybe we can get more people and make that happen, but that will mean we're committing more resources. So it helps to facilitate those discussions. These, this is why project managers tend to use it. This is where it can be really, really helpful. So once again, a moment to pause uh, and open up for questions. Use the raise hand feature or type it into the chat. Uh, I don't know if the Q&A function works, but maybe I have to make questions in there. I'm not sure. So yeah. Q&A works. Cool. So yeah, uh, questions so far. This is kind of our next break point. We're going to shift gears into talking Agile methods next.
Uh, hey, Alex, I have a question. Is there like a, I know you, you've shown uh, the actual triangle uh, and you've shown like what the sides uh, equate to. Is there, and, and you, I've heard you use the term framework a few times. Um, is there an actual formula for the iron triangle or no? So, so when you're discussing it and you're talking about it, is it just a thing where say, for instance, there's, um, um, you know, you have a project going on and someone wants to add a feature uh, and so I guess I guess I'm trying to get around, get to like how do you kind of formulate, you know, based on the type of feature, like what the cost will be, whether or not you're going to need to add x, you know, x amount of people. Like how how does that how do you kind of come up with that? So that is um, that is something that project managers grapple with all the time. The the triangle as a concept as a tool. It's really, it's a metaphor to drive conversations with mm. either with stakeholders or with developers. Now the nitty gritty of, of the formula, like what's what exactly am I trading? This is where you'll see project managers sometimes literally running back and forth between business stakeholders and people who build things to say, well, what if we, so they wanna add this feature how much more is that going to take? Well, how much more time is that going to need? How much more work is that going to be? Well, it depends on if they want it to look like this or if they want it to look like that. Um, it depends on exactly what the requirements are. All of those same conversations that happened when the project was initially being scoped then get reopened. And so the Project Management Institute, which is a, a venerable organization that has exhaustively uh, very academically mapped out the entire concept of managing projects. They're, they're very grounded in what we now refer to as waterfall or stage gate approaches to things. And a lot of energy in that space goes to change management, change management and risk management uh -huh. for this very reason. If you're going to make a change to what was agreed to, there are implications to that change. Anytime you want to change something, therefore, there should be a process. There should be a vetting process where any, anyone who's concerned with the project has a chance to weigh in to decide whether or not this change should be allowed. Right. So this is one of those areas where projects that are run that way, if you're running them very rigorously or if they're very complex or if they have regulatory constraints on how they get executed, there's a lot of overhead with a change. There's a lot of work with a change. For this very reason, there isn't a simple formula. Gotcha. Some changes would be cheap and easy, right? Like, oh, sure, yeah, one more line, sh 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 done. Other changes would be like, uh, yeah, no, I'd have to re-architect like six months worth of work to change that. So there's no magic formula. There, if you Google for project management triangle, you look for images, there's literally hundreds of variations on this. And some of them are much more complex. They have like sub triangles within them where they're trying to make it all fancy and complicated. Uh -huh. But fundamentally it's really like it's a metaphor and that's that's it's an opening gotcha. to a conversation. Gotcha. Seems like we have a couple of questions too. Cool. Thank What's you. The best source to learn agile methodologies. Is there any course? I'm looking for entry level jobs planning to learn agile methods. Yes, there are some delightful places to learn agile methods. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next section. Uh, what constraint is the most flexible and the least one? Cost is the most flexible. And that is for all of the reasons of human beings being human beings. So um, cost is the most flexible because that is the area where, where the implications are most likely to be hidden. And when we think about time, very often in a business context, there are external forces that drive us towards a particular date. More importantly, people who are writing checks, either in the form of your salary, or if you're a vendor, like literally paying you, the extra weight that they have creates a power dynamic where 
it's less likely that they will uh, that they will change that. Whereas the cost of building the thing has more variability. There's more squishiness. Um, as Greg was just asking, like there's no formula that says feature X should should take Y amount of time. And because of that, inherently there's a human factor that says, well, it's going to take, I, I think it's going to take me a while. It's going to take me a week, but everybody really wants this done in three days. I mean, I guess maybe if I work later or I, you know, if I really luck out and there's no bugs, like sure. And next thing you know, that person's working super late hours or they're working on the weekends. And so the cost is hidden. But from a practical standpoint, that's the one that usually uh, ends up taking the brunt of the, the side effects. Cool. Okay. Let me um, plow ahead. Let me switch back to this view. Okay, cool. So agile methods. I'm going to go a little bit quickly through these because I think most people indicated that they have some familiarity with agile methods. What is agile? Agile is a term. It gets thrown around a lot by a lot of people who don't realize how ambiguous it is. It encompasses literally dozens of different frameworks, processes, and practices for how teams can work together. I did a talk at one of the Black Sun Technology conferences explaining the fundamentals of Agile. I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but I have some of the, the slides out of that to show, to skim through pretty quickly. I'll wager that most of you probably recognize one or more of the frameworks that are in this drawing that I'm showing you, um, or you've used some of the practices that are super common, daily standups, sprints, user stories, Scrum, Kanban, uh, story points. These are all practices and processes that are that came out of uh, different agile frameworks. What is agile fundamentally? It's defined by the agile manifesto. The agile manifesto articulated a mindset, four values, and 12 principles. The mindset and the values are here. Um, Scrum, Lean, Kanban, all those other frameworks are all approaches that folks have created over the decades to put those values and principles into practice. So the values here, what we're saying is when we're building things, we value the things on the left, the things that are in bold, we value those more than the things that are on the right. So if I have to choose, I'm gonna choose working software over comprehensive documentation. Doesn't mean documentation is not good, but if I'm trying to get the software to work, I'm not gonna choose to write the docs instead. I'm gonna make the software work first because that is more valuable than having some comprehensive documentation. Those are the values. As we look at the principles, there's 12 of them. I highlighted some of the ones that I think are particularly relevant to this discussion, which is focusing on early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Merge often, get stuff into production often, and not just small nonsense changes or invisible changes, but valuable changes. The second one, super relevant, welcome changing requirements, even late in development. The third one, kind of reiterating, deliver working software frequently. So not only continuous delivery of valuable software, but frequently. Um, I won't list them all out, but then the other one I really wanted to highlight, working software is the primary measure of progress. So with those principles in mind, then we have all these different methodologies and frameworks that come out of that. When we look at the approach to almost any of these uh, agile frameworks, you almost always see these loops. And it's because it's intentionally, it's iterative. It's saying like waterfall and staged gate says, define it all first, and then step very carefully forward through each phase, build it, validate it, you know, then roll it out and deploy it. Yay, we're done, high five, big outcome right at the end there. Agile says, you know what? Build some small version, then build a slightly larger version, then build the larger version on top of that. Like build up cumulatively, get it in front of real human beings, real customers. 
Another metaphor that's super popular for uh, how Agile goes into practice, the top model says like, hey, I want, I want a way to get really fast from point A to point B. Okay, let's talk about this. You want a car? All right, great. Well, first I should make wheels, then I should connect the wheels, then maybe I put a frame on top of the wheel base that I built. And then after all of that, then I'll have a car for you. So make sure you tell me everything that I need to know about that car right up front so that you know by the end of the year, I'll have that car for you. Agile says, hey, you want a faster way to get from point A to point B? Cool, let me build you something. How about this? Skateboard, four wheels and a board. Gets you from A to B faster. Like, oh, it's okay. All right, well, what if we made it into a scooter? How about a scooter? Is that better? Closer? It's a little more fancy? And I'm like, okay, I'm getting somewhere. Hey, how about if I built a bicycle? I can build a bicycle. We can do that. Now that we learned things from building the first couple of things, now I understand wheeled conveyances. Maybe I could put a motor on this thing. Now we're starting to get somewhere. And finally, now I understand wheeled things and I understand motors. Now I can put a frame around that whole thing. Now you're protecting from the elements, da 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 da, da. Boom, you got a car. That's the, that's the common uh, way that we talk about Agile versus Waterfall is build it incrementally, get feedback. Don't assume you know everything up front. Assume that you're going to need to change. And any companies that are competing uh, in highly competitive spaces, building new software that hasn't been done before, this is a very real thing for them. You don't know what the thing needs to look like all the way at the end. You only know the problem you're trying to solve and the, the, a rough idea of how to solve it. So agile methods are way more adaptable and way more um, usable for those scenarios versus I know exactly what I need and it has to meet some very strict criteria and I can detail all those out for you right up front. Okay, cool, waterfall away. Question time again. I'm gonna pause. I see someone has popped up on video. Maybe that means you raised your hand. Let me turn my camera back. Hi, Tanya Amos. I don't know if you have a question or if you're popped up for another reason. You're, you're muted, Tanya, in case you're trying to speak. Uh, you're still muted. <laughs> so some of what's coming up in the chat, uh, can we speak about software devs trying to implement agile methods, uh, more importantly, cadences? So that's, that's, there's a lot there. That's a lot to talk about. Um, it can be hard. It can be hard to, to do it within a group without someone with some experience. And also it can be hard to do it if you don't have buy-in <coughs> from management, at least one or two layers up, because it's gonna be a very different way of working. And there's a lot of buy-in that you need to get. There's a lot of like expectation management that, just because it's a very different way of developing software. So that one's tricky. Cadence wise, uh, this varies a little bit, but the sort of commonly understood most frequently chosen cadence is two weeks. So people who are using a Scrum framework, who are working with iterative development, uh, probably using sprints, the most commonly chosen cadence for that is two weeks. That is not, um, it's not formal. It's not like uh, fundamental to the framework. It's simply what many people have settled on. It has to do with, I can wrap my head around two weeks worth of stuff. I can tell you, I can probably tell you what I did in the last two weeks right now. I can probably tell you what I could accomplish in the next two weeks. If I go longer than that, I'm less likely to be correct. It's harder and harder to predict what I can do over three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. So two weeks seems to be a commonly um, recognized like good cadence. You talk about getting clients to adopt Agile. <sighs> Yeah, that's hard. It's a really different way of working with them. It, it, it expects, it requires them to be much more involved. Um, your contracts have to be structured differently because you can't, you don't wanna set up an agile project with um, a statement of work 
where you get paid based on the deliverables. You want to set up an agile contract. If you're going to contract and work in an agile way, then you want to have essentially like a, a set of working agreements to say, you're going to pay us this hourly rate. Uh, we're going to check in every X number of days and lay out the next segment of work. And we're going to re-up on you paying us. So it's a it's a very different cycle for um, how the contract is is defined and so yeah it's tricky it's that that's some some navigation to do right there uh, let's see Zena can you speak to more importantly cadences to development but not addressing bugs and other errors do you think the waterfall method or another version of Azure are better. Zena, I don't think I understand your question. Maybe you could restudy it or, or come off mute. Sorrel, what is the best to convert ideas into a process through the Agile methods? Also, what is your preferred tool? There are a number of tools that I like. Uh, I'm kind of tool agnostic. For tracking work, my current company uses Jira, and I think that it is pretty powerful. But Asana and Trello are both also uh, very powerful tools for teams of different sizes. I don't have super strong feelings about that. Um, I'm more about the mechanisms within teams uh, learning how to uh, work effectively. So it depends a lot on like what makes sense in your organization. Hello. Hi. Hi, it's Zena. Hi. Hi, I'm sorry I didn't answer my ask my question completely. I hit enter too okay. soon. But came in oh, too yeah. Um, so I actually do work in a software development company and I'm an uh, agile certified professional with PMI and all that other stuff. But my question is trying to get, I found that using agile software developers, unless we're going to do strictly development, that two week cycle often doesn't address bugs unless you're doing like a really, really small amount of development work. So are there other, and I actually found in some cases, depending on how big the project was, that Waterfall was kind of better because it gave us more flexibility because of the time frame. Are there other agile or similar project management softwares that, or just techniques that you find work better for longer term development and testing um, procedures? So addressing bugs with Agile methods is definitely a thing. My experience has been that, so if you look at some of the fundamental Agile documentation, or if you look at any of the specific frameworks, if we're talking about Scrum, I'm not sure if we are or not, but if we're talking Scrum, many of them operate from a premise that quality is really important and that the team should focus on building systems that reinforce quality and make quality easy to achieve. There is an expectation that you should be using robots to test things as much as humanly possible. There should be automated test suites all over the place because we wanna be able to move fast, we wanna be able to try things and that is dramatically cheaper if robots are doing the testing. If it's really hard to break your code, then you can feel a lot more confident in trying stuff. So most agile methods take that as, a, as table stakes. If you have a fragile system, if you don't have end-to-end -end testing, if you don't have a good test practice, um, if you tend to find a lot of bugs manually, then you're gonna struggle to stay nimble. Only way to compensate for it is, so other things come into play. The team has to feel a sense of ownership of what they're delivering. The stories that they're attempting to deliver have to have acceptance criteria. You don't have to use all the formal language. We, we but have it's not enough. So it's not enough just to say, I built the thing. You have to say, this thing is done. And done has to mean it passes the tests, which means the bugs are resolved. There's, there's, all, there's layers and layers to it. And I've had this struggle with some teams and then other teams have worked it out a lot better. But for me, it fundamentally comes down to if you have existing bugs in the system that you wanna be getting addressed, it's on the product owner to be prioritizing some amount of those into every work cycle. If you're having trouble getting the stories to done because they have a lot of bugs that then need to be fixed, 
the team has to say, why? Why does that happen? Why do we have so many bugs? Why do we think we can get these things done, but we can't? We end up with bugs. And that each team has to look at that and have some hard conversations about what should we try differently? What, what should we do? Should we commit to less? Right. Should we test earlier? At that point, it's really like the team has, this is the framework of continuous improvement says, if you're struggling, team, ask yourself why you're struggling. Try things, try things to improve it. Each team will find different solutions. That's what comes to mind. It, it's a many layered challenge for sure. Thank you. Cool. Okay, let me bounce back into it because now we're getting to like the good stuff where it gets to compare uh, one to the other. So example number two, or, or bouncing back to our Zoom example, we're competing. Uh, we want to compete with Zoom. We know they have background images. What do we do about it? What an agile team might do is to say, okay, cool. We want to compete with Zoom. They have background images. We don't. Let's talk about this in terms of what users want. Can you articulate what users want to be able to do? and why, like what's in the user's head? What do they care about? Um, cool, let's talk about that. Now, let's break that down into specific scenarios or use cases or user stories. As a person use on video conference, I don't want you to see all the crap that's behind me because my room is a mess. So I wanna be able to not see that and replace it with a cool background. Okay, well, let's build something that works. Well, what if we, blurred the background. How about that? And this is exactly what Google did. They released background blurring. It didn't have images, but you could blur it. And the edges were bad and it was uh, kind of so-so, but it was better than nothing. And so they said, okay, cool, got it out. It's in front of people. We see whether or not they use it. We see whether or not they turn it on. We hear bug reports. We hear back from customer support. Let's use that feedback and use the insights that we got, getting that to work. And now let's choose what should we do next? Should we make blurring better? Or should we figure out how to make that an image instead of a blur? Now, what Google chose to do is they chose to step forward and make images out of, and allow images. Their edges are still not great. Um, it's still kind of fuzzy in my experience, but it mostly works, it works well enough and so that is a completely different approach to the problem. And it, it meant that you weren't worried about doing this long plan. You weren't worried about something that was gonna take six months. You said, let's solve the most useful problem first and just see what happens and get it out. So it's a whole different way of thinking about problem solving, about project planning, and why would you do this? One of the biggest things is you minimize the wasted time and wasted effort. You don't minimize the overall delivery time if you have a fixed scope. An agile approach is not necessarily going to deliver you that full scope faster. But if you, if you think of doing an entire project and then realizing that it was a stupid project, or realizing that it wasn't going to help your metrics or wasn't gonna sell more of whatever you wanna sell, you just spent that whole time, you built that whole scope and then realized, shit, it didn't help us. Okay, well now we gotta go do something else. Agile says, minimize that loss by doing things in small bits, doing things in small steps and checking in and checking in and checking in. And so at most, you would have built something that took you one cycle if that's two weeks, if that's three weeks, four weeks, whatever, you would have lost one cycle's worth of time on a bad idea. And then you would have realized it was a bad idea, said, okay, forget that, try something else. But you dramatically reduce the potential for wasted time and effort. You're also getting things to done. And this is something that is often understated, but for business folks, like having something working is just so much more powerful, so much more impactful than having a whole lot of infrastructure with nothing that actually uh, customers can use. And finally, it lets you be more nimble. It lets you be more flexible. It lets you respond to changes in the marketplace. It lets you respond to a different understanding of a problem. 
a lot of the problems that we solve, we don't know what the answers are going to be. And so barreling forward on a solution is a bad idea. We're gonna find out stuff within the first two, three weeks. And if we're fixated on a fixed scope, then suddenly all this overhead kicks in, all this process kicks in. Oh my God, we have to change the scope of the project. Well, now I have to get three VPs to sign off on it um, versus we're gonna take this two cycles at a time. We're gonna commit to one quarter or one month worth of the scope of this and then reevaluate. It's a whole different way of thinking about it. Okay, I'm not actually gonna stop for questions here because I wanna keep this moving and respect our time. So what's the face off? What do we see? Triangle versus Agile. Is this a fair comparison? We can look at the wins and risks. I've talked about some of the wins. I've talked about some of the risks with the triangle approach, with the, the Agile approach. Is this actually fair to compare these in this way? I'm totally leading into this, but no, it's not actually fair. Iron Triangle is not a methodology. It's not even a framework. It doesn't tell you how to build software. It's just a, a truism in the same way that you can talk about the 80-20 rule or the sunk cost fallacy, that's the Iron Triangle. Now, the Iron Triangle is often associated with a waterfall mindset. And so in my comparisons, I've mainly been comparing Agile and Waterfall. But I do think it's really important to call this out to say like, there's nothing fundamentally, there's nothing in the Iron Triangle that you can say, compare the Iron Triangle to Agile methods. If you think about it though, you'll see examples of the triangle in all different aspects of your life. We talked about this a little bit earlier. The tension and tug of war between cost, time, and scope exists everywhere. But just like the 80-20 rule and other really broad statements about how people build software, the triangle kind of oversimplifies things, sometimes to the point of being useless. So most significantly, if you're talking about things or if a project manager or uh, another manager type of person um, is talking about things in terms of the iron triangle, it's a hint there that you're approaching things from a very waterfall perspective, from a very fixed scope, us and them perspective. And for that triangle to be relevant, the scope, the time and the cost all have to be known. If there's a lot of unknowns in any of those three, then you can't do that trade-off. You can't make those trades. You have to have that data in order to make a good trade-off. So with modern software applications, as I've talked about, we're often solving problems that haven't been solved. We're doing things that nobody's done before. We don't have a run book. We're solving the problems as we get into it. So time and cost are extremely difficult to know ahead of time. And even the scope may not be understood when we start the project. With so many variables at play, it would prompt us to change the scope. Uh, it makes this triangle not helpful. It doesn't help our businesses to succeed. And so that's why it's relevant to talk about Agile methodologies in a comparative way. So does Agile make the triangle irrelevant? Thinking about those Agile principles we talked about, delivering, uh, satisfying the customer early, and with continuous delivery of valuable software, welcoming changing requirements, even latent development, and delivering working software frequently. Ceremonies and practices like daily standups, sprints lasting one to three weeks, user story language, all those function together with quality controls, with team ownership, with all of that buy-in, with like close customer collaboration. All that together can change that whole dynamic. It can change this us and them dynamic of you have to make a trade. If you want this feature, it's gonna cost you more. It's gonna take more time. Instead of worrying about a six month project that might or might not you know, make or break the company, we get changes to market in a month and get feedback to tell us if we're on track. We're all on the same page. We're all working together to solve the problem, to move the business forward, to get the win. And I see your question, Sorrel. I'll get to that in a hot second. Um, so the Agile approach minimizes how much we commit ourselves to at any point. And so we can welcome the requirement changes because it means we'll get a better product. A lot of this is about like work together. 
get everyone bought into what business problem we're trying to solve, what customer problem we're trying to solve, and people will find really clever solutions. They'll find better ways to solve the problem versus just delivering you what you asked for, which oftentimes isn't the best solution for the problem. So in organizations that are really using agile approaches and are really embracing agile approaches, the iron triangle is a tool to negotiate with stakeholders could go away. It just doesn't really become relevant anymore. If the customer is embedded with the team or very closely tied to the team, if the team is fully invested in what we're trying to achieve and they see the, the big picture, they understand the client needs, um, then they're making those trade-offs all the time in their brains or in discussion with their group. Daily stand-ups are making trade-offs. Weekly sprint plannings are making trade-offs. All the time they're making those trade-offs just at the micro level instead of the macro level. Excuse me, smaller choice, smaller scale choices made by the team who's building the product and doing it together is going to make it generally feel less like a negotiation. It's less like a trade-off, a tug. It's going to keep the overhead involved in that really, really low. And so you're not going to hear like, well, if you want this, then you have to give me that. It just doesn't happen that way if you're working in an organization that's really embraced those approaches. So perhaps not surprisingly, fundamental answer to whether or not the Agile methods make the triangle irrelevant is it depends. In an org that really has embraced the Agile approaches, I would say, yeah, then the triangle is not really relevant. Realistically, there's a lot of places where they're using some Agile practices uh, without really embracing the mindset like they're not really getting everyone on board for the big win, or they're using agile frameworks in really limited ways. And in those places, the triangle will totally come up. It's going to be helpful for you to understand it. It's going to be helpful for you to be able to talk about it. Um, and you know, it's it is a real thing. It's a it is a real choice that people have to make. Okay, that is it. Let me turn off my slides. And we will jump back into question mode. And Greg, you can call me out. I don't know if I'm if we're good on time. If we have how much time do we have for questions, Greg? I'll put it that way. So I, I slated this uh, for uh, an hour and a half. Uh, so we have until seven thirty. So all right. So Sorrel, I saw what is the we talked about tool. What is the best way to illustrate the effect of changes? in a project to a client. So if we're using the word client. I, I wanted to, I wanted to oh, ask, sure. I, I don't think I asked it the right way. Cool. Um, this has been a, a humongous issue, issue for me because um, I do not, I have not experienced being able to allow a stakeholder and I'm gonna use the two, uh, name here because if it's within a, an organization, I'm dealing with a stakeholder, which is a whole different ball game. And if it's uh, with a small company, which is what I am now, I'm dealing with a client, right? And I, they, I look at them both the same. However, uh, I have not experienced a perfect way of giving an illustration to that client or stakeholder the ability to see the effect of the changes to the overall project. Okay, you move, you move this part and this is what happened. You move that part, this is what happened. You change this, this is what happened. Where I can give a perfect illustration of that project where instead of come up to me and say, I wanna make this change, you can go look at the changes yourself and see how that affect the entire project and whether you will okay with that before you even bring make that change, do you, do you know of a, a way of uh, of organizing a project or a tool? I, I don't use uh, the uh, Atlassian tools. I used to about five years uh, about five years ago. I'm I'm with I use uh, a lot of the JetBrains uh, tools right now, uh, but I don't have that within the the set of tools. 
do you, do, you, do you know a way to structure a project where you can allow a perfect illustration of the effect of changes within that project? To achieve what you're describing, theoretically, you could create what's called a Gantt chart. Are you familiar with Gantt charting? Uh, yes, I've, I've used it. I've used it, uh, not now, five years ago, I have. I've, uh, so I theoretically, you could make a Gantt chart and tools like MS Project still exist um, and allow that kind of functionality. There are a couple of others, probably some more modern web ones. You, you could set that up. Now, in order for it to be a perfect, using your words, a perfect visualization or representation of these trade-offs and the impacts of scope changes, <clears throat> you would have to have a perfectly articulated project scope with a perfect complete set of features with each feature having been perfectly sized with all of the interdependencies between the feature implementations perfectly mapped, meaning some things are what they call finish start dependencies. I have to finish X before I can start Y. Other things are finish finish dependencies. They both have to finish together. One can't finish without the other. You would have to have mapped out all of those dependencies for all of those features and all of that sizing. If you did that, you could manipulate that Gantt and see the ripple effect. My experience in running projects like that is it's a tremendous amount of work to get close to that amount of data per line item. It's a tremendous amount of work even to get the initial set of features detailed to that level. And it's incredibly difficult for the people who build things to anticipate all of those dependencies because there are hundreds of variables in the architecture and the implementation details that drive those dependencies and make it extremely difficult to map all of that out, which means if it's not perfect information, then you're dealing with incomplete information and you're making bad choices or you're making choices or the, you're creating the appearance of empowerment but it's a it's a farce so like fundamentally i think you're better off saying let's let's articulate what you want let's articulate the problem you want to solve and the scenarios you want to support Let's talk about those and get a team together, sit them down, start discussing like the top five, map out some solutions around the top five, start digging in, build one or two, come back, sit down again, talk it through some more, show you what we built, get some feedback, pick your next top three, tackle those. I think the client will be happier seeing working software in a short time, they'll be happier with that. Seeing real things working will build the trust and get them to, to have confidence that you're all working together to solve their problem. And in my experience, clients care a lot more about that than they do about, well, I can just move these bars around and then I'll see what my new project plan looks like. And it's gonna be exactly like that, especially because it's not going to be exactly like that. The the Gantt chart, the Gantt chart never works for me. I didn't enjoy using it in the project. In the Asana, <laughs> Asana at a high level, uh, it's what I use now, and it so far it's doing what it's supposed to do, and it's integrated well with everything else. 
So I'm happy so with A scrum team that's been working together for a while, that has a sense of how, of that has a good sense of sizing and a good ability to, um, to collaborate and work tightly, which takes probably a couple of months. But if you have a team like that, then the Scrum framework allows you to pre-plan multiple cycles. You can take an entire project scope, you can size the stories within it, and you can map them out and say, okay, well, this two weeks we're planning to deliver stories two and five, next two weeks, stories one and three, next two weeks, stories four and six. Now we'll check in every two weeks, we'll show you what we built. And if you don't want us to do, you know, if you want us to change a plan, change a plan, it's cool. So Scrum allows for that. Tools like tools that allow you to plan sprints will allow you to plan out multiple sprints. And you can share that with clients and show them your plan that lasts two months, three months, four months. It's to that's totally doable in a Scrum uh, team. But yeah, I don't even know if you're, I don't know how your teams are working. So I don't know what's an option for you. Um, Zena is asking about smart sheets. I've heard of smart sheets. I haven't used them. So I don't personally have an opinion on smart sheets. Uh, Xing is asking for different industry, do we use different method or agile is way more popular than triangle now for all industries. Uh, I have been working in the dot-com space for most of my career. Mostly I've worked at companies that are under a thousand people or even under uh, 400 people. And I've predominantly worked in the San Francisco Bay area. In this area, in the dot-com space with smaller companies, agile methods are kind of standard at this point. Most people are using some version of it. Uh, I don't know for other industries. I think that there are other frameworks and methodologies that are more popular, but I don't, I'm not as familiar with those. I hear stories that government agencies are, many of them are embracing Agile as well. Um, I suspect that, I suspect that there are some industries where either because of regulatory compliance or because of ridiculously high quality standards. And because they're not expecting to deliver software very frequently, they don't have that competitive angle. I suspect in those cases, a more waterfall approach is, is still predominant, but I don't personally know the answer to that. Excellent. I think um, seems like all the questions. I don't see any more coming through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> excellent, excellent uh, presentation, Alex. I definitely want to thank you uh, for your time, for volunteering uh, to join us tonight and present um, Triangle versus Agile. Um, yeah, Michael Jenkins says. What I well, really want to know, Greg, is did you learn yeah. anything? Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got muted. I don't know how that happened. Dennis decided I should shut up. Yeah. Fine, Fine it, what, Dennis. What's, what's okay. so funny is it's like I'm, I'm on a team right now uh, that is really, really having trouble um, with – I guess implementing in, uh, agile practices uh, w within a team, and I've been trying to come up with ways to uh, kind of slowly introduce because I'm, I'm I'm I work for a consulting company, and so I'm right now I'm consulting with um, uh, on a project, uh, and so I'm a, I work as a senior DevOps engineer, and I'm not the I'm not the project manager, but the project that I worked on beforehand. Uh, we were uh, we had bought in 100% to the agile methodology and and our you know our our team uh, was really clicking and so I see a lot of uh, pitfalls and things like that that are that are occurring within our team uh, and I've been like you know how can I just slowly try to introduce you know this or this or some of the things that we were doing in and, and this kind of helped formalize you know, what we were doing on the last team and, and kind of put that into uh, you know, more perspective. Cause like, you know, as an engineer, sometimes you get caught up in the engineering work and less in, uh, in, in the project management part of it. And so this really helped kind of 
solidify all that. So it gives me gives me some ideas. I'm going back to the team or uh, the next time we have, um, uh, you know, whether you know, we they say we have like grooming, but it's not really it's not really grooming. But you know, <laughs> but the next time we go back to that, I'll be able to kind of come with 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 some stuff to to kind of help us out. So yeah, I definitely learned some stuff. A lot of people who are agile coaches, a lot of people who whose career is about helping folks through these transitions will say mm -hmm. that it is extremely difficult to get um, to get groups working well with agile without buy-in um, from the top. Mm -hmm. However, my experience has been you can get a lot of wins if fundamentally the like the main lever is if the team is invested in improving. Yeah. If they want to learn how to work better together, then the framework of continuous improvement, the framework of using experiments just means, hey, let's check in every X time, week, two weeks, let's check in, let's try something different. So doing a retro, even if your groomings suck, if your retros are good and people are honest, that's your leverage. Yeah. Hey, I'm seeing we have this pain point. Can we try this? We try this one thing differently in the next work cycle and then check in. Did that help? Yes, great. Can we keep mm -hmm. doing it? Mm -hmm. Oh, it didn't help? Let's try something different. If you do that, you can gradually introduce better behaviors, cleaner practices, cleaner processes. You highlight the problems. You start to see the patterns. Like that unlocks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, and it's something that the last time I was on, uh, we didn't start out with doing retrospectives. Uh, it came uh, later, but it, we found that that helped a lot. And I agree with you about, you know, our, our team was doing something that other teams weren't doing. So it wasn't like a top down thing. It was, you know, how can we improve as a team? And that's what came out of it. And I think we became, you know, more of a model uh, for others after that. Um, but yeah, so getting this team, I think the retrospective is, it, and we don't do retrospectives right now. So I think that that could be a great, a great starting point uh, to getting some, you know, moving towards uh, improvement. So yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, 731. Uh, again, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank everyone else on the call for for showing up, and participating, asking questions. Uh, I did put a link to um, the Blacks and Technology Foundation. Uh, I'll put it in there again, just so it's the, one of the last things. Uh, joining us free button. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's definitely it's free to join. Uh, I want to say thank you to the people that have joined um, during this during this call, and uh, and and you know visit foundation.blacksandtechnology.net/events, uh, and you'll see you know all of our upcoming events and what's coming up in the future. So, with that, I'll say thank you, thank you, Alex, thank you, Dennis, for helping to facilitate everything, and everyone have a wonderful holiday, a wonderful New Year. If we don't. You know, talk and, and, and Slack or something before then. Uh, and we'll see you then. Thanks a lot, Alex. Thank you.